Welcome everyone. I'd like to call tonight's regular council meeting to order. Recommendation of the regular meeting be suspended and the committee of the whole meeting be convened. Moved by Councillor Renhawa, second by Councillor Nish. All those in favor? Motion's carried. I'd like to call tonight's committee of the whole meeting to order. Recommendation that the agenda of the committee of the whole meeting of June 25th, 2018 be adopted and circulated. Moved by Councillor Renhawa, second by Councillor Cunningham. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. First up, we have public comment on our 2017 annual report. So those in the members of the public that like to come speak about the annual report specifically uh, can do so uh, today. I'm also noticing, is there no microphone up here? Thank you. It's okay. Thanks. Okay, so those who would like to speak about the annual report can do so now. And I'll call a second time regarding the annual report. And a third and final time around the annual report. Okay, seeing no public comment around the annual report, I'll invite any other members of the public to come forward to speak about uh, any topic uh, of their choice. So if there's any members of the audience who'd like to speak about any topic within the community, they can come forward uh, and, and do so now. Absolutely. Welcome. Thank you. And you can press the little green button on that mic there to activate it. Indigenous people here introduce themselves by tribe and crest and lineage. I would like to introduce myself. My father, Fenton Scott, was an exploration geologist who found more mines than anyone else in Canada. His father's family emigrated from Scotland in 1630. My mother's, his mother's family were United Empire Loyalists who immigrated from the 13 colonies in 1776. My mother's father's family, the McCallums, came from Scotland to fight with Gener General Wolfe's army in 1756. My mother's maternal line is Micmac from Gaspé, Quebec. So in more ways than one, I am an old Canadian. <laughs> I grew up in Canada's first suburb, Don Mills, Ontario. My education was very progressive. In grade 8, I was female athlete of the year. In grade 13, I was student council president and valedictorian. I was also a Gold Cord Canadian Girl Guide. I graduated from St. Francis Xavier University in 1977, that's in Anaganish, Nova Scotia, and the University of Victoria in 1982. My first year teaching was in a small Cree village in northern Alberta where the children came to school in horse and wagon. Then I worked with emotionally disturbed children and juvenile prostitutes in Vancouver. I also taught English as a second language there for five years. I came to Prince Rupert in 1995 working as a deckhand on a gillnet boat. Then I spent five years working for School District 52 as a teacher on call. From 2000 until 2016 I taught upgrading to 90% Aboriginal adults as well as ESL to immigrants at what was called Northwest Community College. 
In 2004, I started community adult literacy programs in Prince Rupert, and I became a literacy practitioner working for nonprofit societies. In 2006, I founded Salmonberry Trading Company Society to promote and develop Aboriginal arts, language, and culture. We held the Salmonberry cruise ship and the Salmonberry farmers markets. Alone and with my friends, we have raised over $250,000 in grants. Since 2004, my Haida Carving husband and residential school survivor, Jabu Bell, and myself have owned a house on Park Avenue. We have witnessed the amplified detrimental effects of the concentration of Aboriginal poverty, especially since a liquor store opened its doors on Park Avenue. We are concerned that the 27 apartments for homeless alcohol and drug addicted men and women will be built beside the transition house where women and their children live. Gakatla is also building housing at the former Anchor Inn. When I spoke with Councillor Barry Cunningham, he emphasized the city is looking for solutions, not only complaints. I thought about what I learned from the Transition Town presentation of City Repair from Portland, Oregon. I remembered what Mayor Lee Brain said about engaging the residents of McCola with the McKay Park development. I remembered that CAPS is, has a home already in McCola housing, and I thought about an townhouse for literacy and social enterprise and a place for people who live there to gather. I remembered our table's discussion with the Honorable Shane Wilson, the Minister of Social Development and Poverty, that centered on the benefit of neighborhood houses in Vancouver. That was in January when Jennifer Rice organized at the Niska Hall uh, discussion throughout the hall by different people about solutions to poverty. So I come to you today to ask for council's support to s establish a neighborhood house in McCola. We need a place where the residents can meet and eat together and be empowered to make positive change in our neighborhood. I believe that Changemakers Education Society, whose mandate is to help people acquire the skills, knowledge, and confidence to take part in developing healthy community and live a fulfilling life, should operate the neighborhood house because we know how to empower people to make change from the grassroots building community. Our executive director and board of directors have a combined 28 years of teaching experience and 16 years experience as literacy practitioners. The majority of our board are Aboriginal. I guess what I'm asking is if I can have support from council to go forward to my contact, her name is Roberta in Victoria and she issued the press release for um, uh, in November about the provincial government BC housing providing the housing for homeless people here. So I'm if this and I believe the city has been working with BC housing about where uh, in locating the place for the homeless people and uh, I would like I, and I know that then I conclude that the city has contacts. I've also been forwarding all my thinking to um, Joseph Jack and Jennifer Rice, whose government is re responsible for BC housing. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> uh, so thank you for the presentation. Yeah. Um, Committee, the whole council doesn't make decisions, but we just listen first. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing we can commit to is, is, is organizing a meeting with yourself and Jennifer Rice's office and ourselves to talk more about this Great. idea. Does that work for you? Great. And Great. I, I could bring people who weren't available today, like our executive director. She's involved in uh, a different meeting. Great. Yeah. I think that would be something wonderful to discuss for sure. Thank you. Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you, Joe.
Thank you very much. Is there other members of the public who'd like to speak to council today? Okay, seeing none, I'd like to entertain a motion to adjourn and reconvene the regular council meeting. Moved by Councillor Cunningham, seconded by Councillor Nish. All those in favor? Motion is carried. Okay, recommendation that the regular council meeting of June 25th, 2019 be adopted with additional item 7A UBCM resolution. Moved by Councillor Cunningham, seconded by Councillor Nish. All those in favor? Motion is carried. Item 3A, recommendation that the minutes of the special council meeting of June 11th, 2018 be adopted. Moved by Councillor Ranahawa, seconded by Councillor Cunningham. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion is carried. Item 3B, recommendation that the minutes of the regular council meeting of June 11th, 2018 be adopted. Moved by Councillor Cunningham, seconded by Councillor Nish. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion is carried. Okay, first up we have a report from our city planner regarding the development permit application for 1500 Park Avenue, the 36 unit BC housing project. Welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> the mouse is not working, so I'm going to try to improvise with this tab. <clears throat> the first item on the agenda is the project on Park Avenue. <laughs> Maybe I'll start like this. Um, this project uh, is a um, answer by the provincial government to um, increased number of homeless or near home people who are at peril of being homeless. One moment. I are we able to get tech to get the mi the mouse work in here? No. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Just one moment. Um, uh, for housing for homeless and those who are nearly homeless, and. Um, <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> so, here we go. Um, which will be located at 1450 uh, Park Avenue. Um, this project is done in cooperation with the city and it's working towards developing a Terry Sinks unit um, project. Uh, the planning department has reviewed the um, application for compliance to zoning bylaw and multiple family development permit area design guidelines. The final drawings which are included in uh, attachment three are on, uh, on, on, the s on a screen right now. The uh, final elevations are slightly modified. Uh, this is the material for the exterior cladding and this is the final uh, site plan. On the site plan, we paid specific attention to landscaping. This is the list of plants and location of planting, to parking arrangements and parking numbers, to loading and unloading areas, and to screening of the garbage disposal and recycling materials. Um, <clears throat> The proposal was referred to internally to engineering, building and fire department. Engineering asked for additional information which was supplied to their satisfaction. Fire and building department did not pose any concerns. We have also referred the proposal to Ministry of Transportation and Highways. And this is their response. Uh, first, first, th fourth, and fifth item are directed towards a developer and the contractors to abide by the regulations by Ministry of Highways and responsibilities they have when working within the within the um, uh, highway right away. The second and third are regarding parking. 
For the parking requirements, I have selected the um, um, special care residential requirements, um, uh, parking re requirements of one parking per each three units. In this letter, the owners, should anything happen uh, and the traffic spilling over onto the highways is put onto the city. However, and I have advised BC Housing of such, I will I, I will advise. I, I will include in development permit the, the note that should the use be changed or should there be additional parking requirement, it will be requirement. It will be uh, on the onus of the BC Housing. Uh, in conclusion, the proposed project complies with the, with the zoning regulations and development permit area design guidelines. Development permit is a prerequisite to apply for building permit before commencing construction. Thank you. And just before we do questions from council, I'll just provide some clarity <coughs> to this project as um, when it was announced that the provincial government was going to be providing units, uh, BC Housing approached the city to look for available uh, lots that we could potentially lease uh, through uh, a long-term low lease that would make the project much more affordable. Uh, we went in a van with BC Housing to a variety of different city-owned lots. Um, that uh, could potentially house this many uh, units, um, but it was determined that this lot here was the only real one that was available that had existing servicing uh, available to the site that includes water and sewage and electrical and things like that, which require uh, a massive amount of millions of dollars of construction to do if you're going to do a lot that doesn't have that, which a lot of the city-owned lots are not serviceable at the moment. Um, in addition, uh, the North Coast Transition Society uh, will be managing these units, which allows them uh, the opportunity to manage them through their existing office. And there's a lot of various uh, security measures that are already in place with the Transition House. So uh, the staff at the Transition House now don't foresee any uh, complications between having these units next to the, uh, them. Uh, so it seemed to be a win uh, for all parties there. Uh, however, this is most. This is the only site that's available that the city owns, anyways, uh, that has servicing available and also is already appropriately appropriately zoned uh, to be able to do this development. And so, uh, in terms of um, the amount of time necessary, uh, when you have to do rezonings and provide servicing, it could take up to a year to to do those things. Plus, the amount of cost goes significantly through the roof. Uh, so, in terms of uh, speed and, and, and effort and time, uh, this site is available now, uh, which is why our planner has come forward with this development working in conjunction of BC Housing. And so, ultimately, the decision to choose the lot was from BC Housing. Uh, the city is simply just partnering to ensure that this project is feasible. Questions from Council? Sorry, what exa exactly when, when are these individual standalone units or or are they how are, how are they constructed Mr. Cracker? There is another term for for the units um, and those are single occupancy units SROs. Um, so they're it's essentially a pre-built the modular homes that are going to be brought here and they will have um, individual units with some common areas. So is it going to look like an apartment building or or a bunch of or a bunch of trailers stuck together? If you look, if you, if you look at the elevations, it's going to look like an apartment building. Um, so I'm just going to try not to screw this up any further than I have to. So it's going to look like a, a modest apartment house. A walk-up. Um, I couldn't really right now put a finger on something that would look similar to this that, that we have in a city. Um, perhaps the apartments that are just uh, past the five corners on the left-hand side, but, but slightly, slightly longer. 
They also all have their own individual kitchenettes. There will be a communal kitchen area where um, the NCTS will be providing uh, life skills training, culinary skills training, as well as the NCTS will be providing a 24-hour a day, 7-day a week support service uh, for general needs. And there will also be laundry facilities in the area as well. Do you know if there's going to, uh, the access is, um, is going to be from the inside to each of those units? It's, it's hard to see that little bitty drawing. So, uh, first of all, for development permit, we are looking for form and shape on the outside. We are not really concerned on what's inside. We do look at, at the inside on a, on a secondary basis, and from just a general overview of the floor layout, these are single occupancy, occupancy rooms that some of them are slightly larger than the others. They all seem to have kitchenettes and their individual bathrooms, and if you look in the middle of, uh, I'm looking at the page 14 of the, of the um, of the um, agenda, there's a long hallway that will connect all of the units uh, to the stairways. Councillor Renau. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, is there any be anybody be there for uh, supervision, like ma manager on the site? Again, uh, Councillor Randava, uh, uh, for development permit, we are concerned with the form and shape of the outside and to assure that the zoning, such as setbacks, parking requirements are, are all, all adhered to. With respect to the uh, um, uh, how the, uh, the property will be operated, I haven't really gone into those details, but I would imagine that, uh, that uh, a facility of this nature would have to have, as Mayor Brain just noted, some kind of 24-hour support uh, and uh, an ability to, uh, to manage uh, the, the residents. The, the st there will be staff on site all the time. And do they need any traffic uh, surveys or? So Ministry of Highways essentially uh, came back and they didn't require a uh, traffic, s traffic study. They did, they did mention those, those items in a letter uh, with respect to access and working within this, the highways right away. And um, in my conversations and, and um, um, uh, communications with the highways, I explained that, uh, that the kind of um, um, personnel that will be um, uh, residing in these, in these units are not necessarily going to be car owners. And therefore, I applied um, one of the more liberal requirements that we have in our zoning bylaw. But after their, their co comment to, to us that should that use be changed or traffic parking spilling on the highways that it would be responsibility of the city to manage that I will put that onus onto BC housing in a development permit Thank you. Council Cunningham uh, Minister Highways you have a long stretch of highway there from five corners almost down to the you know like people don't slow down on that road and I can see people wanting to cross from this project over to the other side going up to BC Housing or something like that. The McKay Park development, things like that. Has there been any discussion about a crosswalk or anything between five corners and farther down? Not in this reiteration of, of analysis. Uh, highways didn't bring it up, engineering didn't bring it up, and, and I didn't consider it either. I think it's something that should be considered because you're going to get people crossing there and it's, uh, you know, we already have enough problems with people getting hit in crosswalks, never mind in the middle of nowhere. So I, I think it's something that we should discuss so the city doesn't end up with a bill for a crosswalk or a lighted crosswalk or something like that. You know, it's, it's just a thought. The other thing is, is there going to be any fencing around this project? <coughs> Doesn't it doesn't indicate any fencing uh, around the project? Are they planning on using trees as not natural buffers then, perhaps? I think that the the, the site is well treated uh, both between the uh, between the. Um, um, between the transition house and and the um, and the um, um, the old anchor end, um, 
really when it comes to clearing here they they do not they do not need to clear the entire site so i i imagine also for the cost of construction that they will clear only what's ne essentially necessary right. uh the, the fencing at the front i would suggest would not be visually attractive um the fencing on the side and in the back it's it, it's going to have a substantial setback from the back the only fencing that may be required in the future is fencing between transition house and uh, and, and this pro this project and in principle they're both accommodating similar people right. of different gender but they're all like I, i'm not sure how to respond well, the, to that the that unit is not gender specific it's, it's open to all um homeless folks yep. um my understanding is ncts is working with bc housing on on a division protocol yep. Yep. and just in conclusion as i said you know for development permit we are concerned with form and shape with how things look like with the site plan with landscaping screening uh, heights and uh, things of that nature we are not really concerned with the much with the interior nor how those properties were operated but just for for your information we do have a section in our in our in our zoning bylaw that provides substantial amount of room for nonprofit housing for things like, as you mentioned, um, culinary, um, cooking, and um, various uh, various um, uh, support services. Councilor Nish. Well, I think, like you say, a few times we're here for one reason, and that's form and shape. So, um, obviously, it's a, v a fairly basic building, uh, but. Uh, you know, it's to serve a, a need that's uh, required in this town, and I think, um, you know, I'm for trying to get something going here because, uh, uh, as we've seen in the last year in this town, we it's time to do something about it. So, what a little help that we can do as a city and provide a, a cheap piece of land for for them to use, I think, uh, I think it's, uh, you know, it's serving a purpose and. The form and shape is, it, I mean, I, I have a little bit more creativity in my carpentry, but uh, for what this purpose is, I think it's, uh, you know, it is what it is, and it's, uh, it's a, it's a basic building, but it, uh, it serves the purpose, and, and, uh, you know, it's a modular building. So I've seen some of the ones they've done, done in other towns on the news, and, and you know, they seem to look pretty good. And after they get the landscaping done, it, I'm sure it'll, I'm sure it'll look just as good as the building next door to it. Yeah, they are actually quite nice, the units. Uh, they were showcased at the UBCM last year, uh, the premier showcase what the units look like, and they're, they're quite quality. Uh, it's not just like a trailer stuck on top of it type of thing. And just to also add, uh, before going to the comment here, is that this is part of uh, the BC Housing's new rapid response. Um, and so the whole point is to respond quickly uh, to community issues like this. Um, and so the choice really becomes whether we approve a project like this, and if we don't, then we have people who are going to be living on the street. And so this is to help people finally be able to transition into a place uh, where they have housing first, and then from there they can, the skills and the support services are provided for them to be able to reintegrate back into uh, society. Councilor Cunningham? Oh, I agree 100%. You know, like, we need it. It's a good place for it and that. All I'm concerned about is safety and when it is built. There's, you know, they're just not a, a stark building and no place for somebody to go sit outside or, you know, a little bit of a garden, thing like that. Something, you know, just a little bit of basic landscaping with some benches or that so it'll keep the people that want to sit around and just enjoy a, a day or something like that. You know, it's I, I'm not asking for a lot of different things. I'm just saying it would be nice if uh, there's a little bit of green space and that around the building and that. Councilor Thorgerson? Yeah, I, I think I think that Councilor Cunningham um, has two of my... Um, I didn't realize we were only looking at the form of the outside of the building, Mr. Krakik, so most of my comments were on the inside of the building, but uh, since we're only looking at the outside of the building, I, my, my, the two things that have been brought to, because this has been a, a, a great um, discussion piece amongst um, um, people who are living on the street and and I've talked to a, f a fair number and some of their their concerns are about the insides right and and um, but I think the the two biggest concerns were um, having somewhere outside because um, uh, many people have been living outside for so long that they 
are used to sitting outside and enjoy, you know, on park benches or wherever, and they are looking not just to be confined into a single room. And so some kind of uh, landscaping with park benches or s something like that would be a little fountain if it kind of a thing, you know, but, you know, so something nice where people can sit around and enjoy this beautiful weather that we've been having, uh, not the last couple of days, but the couple of days before that. And the other thing is crossing to the other side of the street. That's the other other concern and it's it's going to be a huge concern I think if they're uh, you know people were saying well you know their 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 neighbor was just across the street and we should have a better way to act or their their relatives were just across the street better way to and I was thinking you know what's across the street uh, to me it was just I didn't quite realize that McKay Street <clears throat> complex is just across mm -hmm. is just across so I think there's going to be some traffic back and forth there and I think we need to put our minds to that just One. add there, Councillor Thurkerson. So there is discussion about that happening with the transition siding highways, because there's going to be three housing units there. So and then to get up to McKay Park, and so it's certainly a discussion that's uh, that is happening right now. Yeah. One one of the things I saw in in um, um, in Vancouver, but also on Vancouver Island when I was gone, is uh, I don't know what they call them, but they're these yellow flashing lights. They're not like a pedestrian crosswalk, uh, like with a with when you push the button it turns red, but they're flashing yellow lights that uh, that somebody presses when they want to cross the street, and then the drivers have to slow down to see that there's somebody crossing. The person crosses, and then and then and they had you know most of those I looked I was very careful to see if, if they were mostly on boulevarded streets or something and and most of them had a boulevard or the biggest streets had the boulevard in the middle but even some of the streets that would be similar to I was thinking of of Second Avenue downtown I wasn't quite thinking of Park Avenue when when I was thinking about that of whether something like that would make things safer for people crossing downtown or not but I really think that we that that those are the issues is is the park issue and the cross and the street issue that were that uh, people pointed out to me were the the issues that would come in f into form and um, <clears throat> I I don't think that um, that uh, we should uh, stop the progress on this one issuing development permit because we are now in a sort of uh, we're starting to get into the critical part of the construction construction season uh, and and um, the crosswalk and uh, and um, uh, uh, is something that's outside of the uh, form and shape. But I will include it in my transmittal letter of a transmittal, and I will likely do uh, and I will likewise do that for the outside uh, treatment. However, we did we did uh, if you look at that itty bitty drawing, and I can supply you a larger one. We did try to take a little bit of uh, a little bit of uh, attention to the landscaping with some you know perimeter landscaping and those couple of areas on either side which I'm going to point out now could be easily you know could easily install a bench uh, in, in either side kind of something similar that they have at a transition house rather than a gazebo and I'll include those in a letter of transmittal. Yeah I think that's just a simple conversation <coughs> with BC Housing I can see that being a simple solution. Any other comments from Council? Okay, so the recommendation that Council issue development permit DP1804 in accordance with the drawings attached to the application and update site plan. Moved by Councillor Cunningham, second by Councillor Nish. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Thank you. Next, uh, another report from our city planner regarding application for development variance permit at uh, 1053 First Avenue West. <coughs> <laughs> I, I, I apologize and I find this extremely um, irritating that I am flipping the drawings in a wrong way, not enough practice. So uh, <coughs> this application for development variance permit is for the property located at uh, First Avenue West 1053. On the screen you see the property location. The application is to um, The application is to reduce the front property setback 
which looks like this. So the front property setback is 3.6 meters. Uh, the uh, request for the variance is to reduce the easterly corner to, eight point, uh, to 2.5 meters or 8.3 feet and the westerly corner to 3.2 meters or 10.8 feet. There is a whole variety of uh, numbers in there, but this is the gist of the variance in red letters. Uh, just for a little bit more uh, of uh, orientation, uh, this is the house in question. Uh, the filled area is about the approximately the extent. This is the westerly corner. This is the easterly corner. And the extent of the filled area will be covered by the deck. The, um, the reason for variance is explained in the application. And suffice it to say that this improvement will benefit the house and therefore the neighborhood in general. The result will not adversely affect the streetscape. In conclusion, uh, Mr. Mayor, the applicant requires approval to proceed to public notification. Okay, recommendation the development variance permit and application DP 1805 for 1053 First Avenue West proceed to public notification. Moved by Councilor Renhawa, seconded by Councilor Cunningham. Discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Okay, seeing as we had a, a, a phenomenal, heart-wrenching uh, presentation last meeting from our city manager, I'm guessing we probably don't need to reiterate the annual report, so a recommendation that council by resolution having heard comments or no comments from the public approve the 2017 annual report. Moved by Councillor Renhawa, second by Councillor Nish. Any further discussion? I just want to say great job to staff on the report, a bunch of new features in it, looks fantastic. Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion's carried. Next, uh, we have a correspondence for action, a UBCM resolution. Uh, the resolution coming forward is uh, the exact resolution that Council passed uh, on March 12th uh, regarding the uh, BC commercial fisheries. I'll read out what the resolution is going to read uh, for the, for the um, UBCM resolution. Uh, so it's moved by Councillor Thorkelson, or actually we'll say, whereas BC Well Com Commercial Fishery contributes $800 million in wholesale value to the provincial economy, of which $400 million is in landed value paid to fishermen when the fish is landed, and whereas rural coastal communities benefit from the portion of landed value paid to fishermen who reside in our communities, and we benefit from wages paid to shore workers if there are processing plants in our community, and whereas the Federal Fisheries Act has been reopened to help ensure the economic benefits of fishing remain with the license holder and their community by providing amendments to the Fisheries Act that would help support a strong independent inshore commercial fishery in Lacta Canada and Quebec and whereas the amended the Fisheries Act would recognize that when making decisions under the Act the Minister can take into account social economic and cultural factors the preservation and promotion of independent inshore commercial uh, fishery as in Atlanta Canada and Quebec the proposed act would clarify the regulations can be made to enshrine aspects of the inshore and fisheries policies and regulations, including rules that help ensure the holder of a license retains the benefits generated by fishing, ensure that only the license holder personally fishes using the li that license, support the fleet separation policy pro pro prohibiting certain types of corporations from holding licenses licenses in the inshore sector, allow the suspen suspension or cancellation of licenses where license holders or are party to an agreement that violates any part of the Act or regulations. These proposed changes to the Fisheries Act would protect middle class jobs and coastal communities by helping keep the benefits from fishing in the hands of, of the harvesters and local communities, strengthen the implementation of the owner operator and fleet separation policies. And whereas these changes to the Fisheries Act would protect middle class jobs and coastal communities by keeping the benefits from fishing in, in the hands of harvesters and local communities only apply to Atlantic Canada and Quebec. And whereas the federal fisheries policies in the Pacific region are to continue privatize the fisheries, which lowers the, re the retained value to working fishermen as they have to pay quota lease fees to investors who are increasingly becoming foreign countries and our communities are not realizing the benefits as our Atlantic communities and therefore be it resolved that the City of Prince Rupert write the Ministry, well, this last part then would be sending this to the UBCM is what I would recommend rather than the last three parts. Uh, so that would be the, um, the, um, the resolution for the UBCM.
So moved by Councillor Cunningham, second by Councillor Renhawa. Discussion? Councillor Cunningham. The, the reason I seconded this the first time around is uh, all we're asking for is parity with the East Coast. You know, you the East Coast has more of a thriving fishery even though at times it's in disarray, but it's definitely more beneficial to the communities and the individuals on the East Coast, whereas in our fishery on the West Coast, corporations are slowly gobbling it up. And a prime example is the five, six hundred cannery workers that were put out of work a season ago because the fish was being processed somebody or somewhere else. If we have adjacency laws in place, those fish will be handled here and create more jobs for everyone. Uh, the other thing is that uh, Right now we're in a crisis with our fishing here and, and I think fishermen, more than anyone else, know how to look after a, a fishery. And if it's up to the individual fishermen to go out and fish instead of the corporations calling the shots, I think the individual fishermen will take better control of the, the resource. You know, a prime example of, of governments helping is the United States just announced that they're putting $200 million into a fund to help communities and fishermen that are devastated by by different fish species not showing up in Alaska it's the pinks and they're getting 56 million dollars to be distributed amongst the communities and the fishermen and then and the other two uh, the rest of the 200 million is going down to Washington Oregon California the Gulf of Mexico so far we haven't found one word from our federal government compensating any of the fishermen at any level, whether they be commercial, uh, sports guided fishermen, or anyone getting compensation for the fact that they're just shutting it down. You know, they're taking the livelihood out of people's pockets and they're, the government's just saying, well, you know, so be it. You know, th this, this, he this resolution here will bring some power back to the people on the coast and especially the fishermen. And I, I, commend Joy for bringing it forward. Other comments? Uh, we had a, um, uh, a fishing adjacency policy brief that went to, um, I be believe it was UBCM last year, or was it the FCM? Or was it a policy brief just for ourselves? <laughs> but anyway, on the bottom the request was that the Provincial Ministry of a Agriculture which is what fisheries is under, work with the Federal Department of Fisheries and Oceans on a fulsome coordinated review of fishing policy on the BC coast, and that the province, and I would suggest say, work with the federal government on the implementation of a regulatory framework that would incorporate the principles of fleet separation, owner operator, and adjacency. Well, I suggest that as a friendly amendment, we could include those two, uh, those are already policy statements on behalf of the City of Prince Rupert into this resolution as well. Okay with the uh, mover and seconder? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, I think, uh, you know, the... Can you, um, can you pass that to Mr. Mandrick as well? Yes, I will. And uh, what, what I am uh, really hoping is that we can begin a discussion um, at the uh, UBCM level. The provincial government has, um, uh, with the... Um, uh, with their new fisheries committee is looking at economic impacts on rural communities um, and trying to increase the benefits of the fisheries for rural communities and uh, it would be good that uh, if we were able to get this resolution passed at the UBCM that um, uh, it would um, uh, it would add further impetus for the economic features of this new committee so that we're not just not that I don't think habitat's important, but I think that habitat is an ongoing issue and, a, and a, a report from a committee to increase habitat monitoring or to in, increase um, um, more, active, more protection activity is, uh, that's going to be ongoing. People are going to be talking about that for years and, and successive governments. But right now is the time to strike regarding the economic uh, we have a, a federal government that has opened up the Fisheries Act and is changing regulations for the East Coast. Wouldn't take much more for them to do to change the regulations for our coast too. So it's the one time when we can get the provincial government, we, or the, that provincial government could possibly um, uh, lobby successfully lobby the federal government uh, to change things for 
Pacific Coast fisheries, and and we need to strike while the iron's hot. So that's why this is an important resolution to go to the convention, UBCM now because. Um, the Liberals will be in election mode next year. We need to get this in this year to make sure that this that this passes. And UBCM is again another um, way that we can put our foot in the middle of the provincial government's back to put their foot in the middle of the federal government's back to try to make things better for coastal communities. Thank you. Further comments? Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Next, uh, we have a recommendation. Council adopts the election voting procedure and automated vote counting system authorization bylaw number 3428 2018. Moved by Councillor Ranhawa, second by Councillor Nish. Further discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Uh, reports from Council. Councillor Nish? Uh, I was able to attend uh, the graduation for. Charles Hayes School and for the Pacific Coast School as a representative of the city and I just want to say uh, well congratulations to them all and and it was uh, nice to see how many uh, people were moving on to secondary education and uh, and uh, I tried to convince them that they need to come back here when they're done and and uh, hopefully help grow our town so uh, just congratulations to them again thanks Councillor Nish other councillors Councillor Renhout Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, uh, last week we had two openings. One was Atlan Promenade and uh, Mariners Park openings, which is great for our community. And uh, we can see how when all organization, community organization get together and make a difference to our community. I like to thank everybody for that. Great, thank you, Councilor Renawa. Other reports? I just want to um, report that. Um, that uh, the first sockeye opening on the NAS uh, is um, uh, today, and uh, we only have two weeks for sockeye fishing on the NAS uh, due to fisheries uh, constraints. And uh, the first sane fishery will be July 5th. So if you are a merchant in town, you got to make hay for the, in the next uh, three weeks because that's when the fleet's going to be here. Councilor Cunningham. On on the uh, Mariner Park opening, one thing that I I thought was really neat is when I went down there, uh, all the kids playing in the park, and Captain Jack Sprack down there with his one of our staff members was dressed up as a pirate, and the kids were just loving it. The kids were lining up to get their pictures taken along with the adults, <laughs> and uh, I, it was just nice to see the park so full of people and and you got to thank the the people that actually contributed to it and one group of people that weren't mentioned is the city workers who put a lot of time and effort in there even though they didn't put a lot of money in there they put a lot of effort into it and they they were around there and it's nice to to see that they're recognized too absolutely okay a motion to adjourn moved by councillor second by councillor Cunningham. all those in favor means adjourn. Thank you very much.